people to come into the room. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the session. Uh, on by behalf of USAID, I'd like to welcome you to this session that's going to focus on water and sanitation provision in areas with geographic challenges. My name is Jesse Shapiro. Uh, I'm the USAID in, uh, Environmental Health Team Lead and a Senior WASH Advisor based in the Bureau for Global Health at USAID. Today, we have a really exciting session for you. It's gonna focus on sharing experiences in overcoming these sanitation challenges in rural Cambodia. Achieving universal sanitation in these challenging environments uh, is very difficult. And while promising approaches like that we have uh, community-led total sanitation, market-based sanitation, social behavior change, and other approaches, and even mixing and layering all these approaches is showing a lot of promise around the world to bring sanitation to those that yet to have it. There are still populations getting left behind. People in challenging environments where there's flooding, uh, high water tables, steep or poor strength soils are examples of some of these people being left behind, not just due to affordability or access to supplies, but due to these challenging conditions where they live. And the numbers are really growing due to climate change, lack of investment in the sanitation sector, and other things. The challenge of sanitation in these areas often requires more expensive or more complex sanitation systems, for, for example, raised pits or complex series of tanks, and frequent and specialized emptying and treatment services putting these solutions farther out of reach for the populations that may already struggle to access sanitation facilities uh, due to these comp compounding vulnerabilities. Uh, the USAID agency plan, which is part of our uh, US government global water strategy, emphasizes this need to really focus on populations like this, meeting the needs of the marginalized and underserved and communities, uh, particularly in these vulnerable situations. And while groups in these uh, situations can often refer, be referred to as the last mile, it is really critical on the pathway to universal sanitation. We don't leave them to the last. We must identify solutions now, especially since these numbers are growing and have to reach them at a faster pace to achieve our universal sanitation aspirations. Today, we will hear some experience from Cambodia on doing just that. And so let's jump in. Today, we're first gonna hear from the USAID Integrated Early Child Health Development Activity implemented by RTI for a project introduction. Then we're gonna hear from some experience uh, from 17 Trigger, Triggers uh, Agency on Changing Behaviors and two other groups on some innovations, innovative solutions in these situations, Engineers Without Borders and the Cambodian NGO Wetlands Work. Then we're gonna open it up for some Q&A and discussions as the speakers share, I welcome you to put any comments or questions in the chat box. So without further interruption, I'm going to hand it over to Mrs. Safarni Fan, who's going to lead, who leads water and sanitation and environmental health for projects for RTI and has really extensive experience in WASH and challenging environments. Safari, over to you. Thank you, Jesse, for the very nice introduction. So let me uh, follow on with the IEC Cambodian Integrated Early Childhood Development. I will just move quickly because of the timing, so I will not talk much about what uh, uh, exactly IECD is doing, but it's just a piece of IECD work is on water and sanitation and hygiene initiatives. So next slide, please. Uh, just walk through you all through uh, a little bit on Cambodia. So here is the overview. Cambodia is a small country administratively divided into 25 provinces. 
more than uh, 100 of district administration and can and within the subnational, the local government uh, known to be commune and Songkhat and village is the lowest level. In total, we are still less than 17 million population and out of that, more than 10 million uh, tend to live in the rural area. And recently, the government also defined uh, population living in challenging environment is around 40 million. Next slide, please. So here is about IECD. Uh, mainly, there are four areas of work, and what initiative is one of the main areas of work and the IECD uh, implementation activity. So I will talk more on water sanitation while I uh, uh, get permission to skip the other three, which is a lot more to be described and the time is not allowed. Thank you. Next slide, please. So the WASP initiative aimed to expand access to safe, equitable and sustainable improved water supply and sanitation service. There are four main approach that we design under the WASP initiative. So one is to strengthen the was enabling environment and expand access to improve water supply services as well as sanitation. And finally, uh, we also have government help government to address behavior chain communication and sanitation solution in challenging environments. Next slide, please. Uh, in the area of uh, strengthening was enabling environment, we mainly support the subnational government to plan and implement the water sanitation services in their boundary. We also build local authority, especially the commune councillor, to be uh, a leadership champion uh, in leading was service delivery in their uh, target area and uh, focus mainly on trying to accelerate the coverage of sanitation to uh, compete among themselves uh, toward increasing more household to build and use latrine. Next slide, please. So here is another area of work. I just want to walk through quickly on the country situation. So this uh, graph mainly saw uh, the access to basic drinking water supply among rural population. So you can see uh, still uh, less than 20, 30% of the rural population without having basic drinking water supply. So part of the IECD was initiative, we try to work closely with the local authority as well as with the existing water supply operator to identify a poor household and vulnerable family for those who didn't get access to the high connection yet. So that is the main work under this area. So as of now, we may need to reach to more than 1,004 households to connect to the high water supply. Next slide, please. So sanitation, similarly, uh, it's appeared that uh, the remaining population is more or less the same with the water supply. It's less than 30% that still uh, use and improve uh, still access to unimproved, uh, mostly the practice of identification. So part of this intervention, uh, IECD was initiative also work closely with local authority and the latrine business owner to identify poor households and support them to build latrine with latrine material subsidy. So we may need to reach out almost 2,000 uh, poor family to build a latrine with the uh, latrine material subsidy. Next slide, please. So challenging environment here, uh, nationally, it has been defined, defined by the guiding principle. So it's appeared that in 2019, the government uh, see it is important. So the government has led the process with 
sanitation stakeholder to develop guiding principle and define uh, area uh, a challenging environment area which refer to floating uh, seasonal flooded high ground area uh, hard ground and the water scarcity area so this has guide the uh, intervention by the key sanitation stakeholder so IECD also uh, part of that the was initiative we also step in and help the national government address some gap by working with key partner expertise to assess the behavior of the last mile population and design, uh, tailor the strategy and tool to target this last mile population uh, to trigger change among them to adopt latrine. We also work with uh, Engineer Without Border as the key expert to review the sanitation solution, especially to identify the appropriate uh, latrine technology for challenging environment. I will not talk more because the next speaker will talk detail on each of these topics. Thank you. Next slide, please. So it's come to last. I would say um, Cambodia tend to work well toward addressing uh, challenging environment area, especially the government led develop uh, the guidance for working in that area, trying to also uh, address the behavior change and also developing sanitation solution. But uh, it is still not enough yet. So more effort uh, still required to address unique problem of this geographically challenging. So for example, like uh, still, although the government already estimated 4 million uh, of the population, that's mainly based on the flooded uh, data, while the overall, the full picture of where and the scale of the challenging environment in the country has not been uh, addressed yet. Also, in terms of how to reach those areas, it's still very difficult and especially very limited services, although we identify some solution, but uh, still the capacity and the service delivery is not there yet. Uh, in addition to that, the cost is very expensive. We observe that it mostly cannot be afforded by the community living in that particular area. And it's also a big question around uh, fiscal slack management and the sustainability in the relation to the current climate uh, change issue in the country. So more investigation, evidence and design need to be uh, explored and test and collect more evidence on the effectiveness of it. So I should stop here and allow time to other speaker to talk more detail on the behavior and the solution and the contextual evidence of this uh, challenging environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Safani. Great uh, introduction. And I think we're ready to jump, jump into some more specific experience here. Uh, our next speaker, I'd like to introduce uh, Imara Roitriari. A uh, strategist researcher at 17 Triggers with strong expertise in human centered design and SBC, SBC strategy development, who's going to talk about integrated uh, early childhood development, sanitation behavior change for last mile communities. Imara, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I would like to talk today about really the problem in Cambodia in terms of behavior and sanitation. So um, I think later on we'll hear about some of the solutions, but I'll show you some of the people that we met in the field. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, our first location that we did research, so we did research with RTI and the IECD project to really understand the behaviors and barriers to demand for latrines. Um, and the first place we went was the floating village, or one of the first places we went was the floating village. So floating villages are places where 
um, people move around with their houses on the water almost like sometimes every day, sometimes seasonally. And these houses really go up and down with the water. So in some of these villages, it's 100% of the population is practicing open defecation. Um, that means, oh, sorry, if you can go back. Um, so they they use the bathroom in the back of the house or in the hole. And then at the front of the house, they wash their clothes, they bathe, they do all of these different things. Um, and one quote that we heard was, we, we wash clothes in front of the house and OD behind the house. But it is disgusting to see the shit or the the feces floating around outside the house. Um, and one of the problems that we heard from them is that they don't know if there's a latrine that would actually work in a floating village. They've never seen one. They've never heard of one. So they have basically no demand for one. But if they saw something that could work, they would be very interested to buy one. Um, and so here they really recommended to us that you put the latrine in a public place, let them try it for a few seasons, and then the demand would skyrocket among the community. Um, in the next slide, uh, another population that we found um, that had a major barrier to latrine adoption, not necessarily in terms of location, but in terms of the household, was households where there are major physical disabilities. Um, and so we saw in some households where there was one person who had a severe physical disability, whether they were unable to walk or um, something like that. And then maybe they had other people in the household or in the family who were um, not having that same disability, but still that one person might not be using the latrine or that one household might not have a latrine that was equipped for physical disability. Um, and so one lady that we met uh, mentioned that she goes in the back of her house and it's very painful. It's difficult for her, but she doesn't know what other options there are for her because she's never seen a latrine that's equipped for somebody with her type of physical disability. And she's not the main decision maker in her household. So in her household, actually, her son is the one that would have to buy her the latrine. So our recommendation here is to create a guide for designing a latrine that's disability friendly and show how each person can create little adaptations in their latrine to really respond to the needs of the person in their house. Um, and then also show the decision maker who might not be that person, how it's something that's feasible and also adds dignity um, to the person's life. Um, next slide. Um, one of the really interesting findings that we had in some of the villages um, where there was a trend towards adoption of latrines was that it's more shameful to ask about sharing a latrine. So asking a neighbor or asking a friend or somebody else in, in your household's vicinity to share. It's more shameful to ask about sharing than to simply practice open defecation. Um, and this was really interesting because w one of the households that we met they invited their children to continue using the latrine and the shame completely disappeared. So the invitation to share um, is almost a starting point for the self-purchase behavior. So instead of, um, so they can try it out, they can see that they like it and then they can start to save money. So use it as like a jumping board for the next steps. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so this was a really interesting example in Cambodia. Um, in Cambodia, of course, um, people have been through the Pol Pot regime, especially older people. And in this um, community, what we heard from the, the participants was that pit latrines have a really painful association. So during the Pol Pot regime, a lot of people, a lot of young people or families had to share the same pit latrine and it was disgusting. Like they had to, it was, it was communally used. They had to empty it out and use it for farming. And those associations made it so that they would never consider a pit latrine if it was their only option. Um, and they would just rather get a wet latrine. And here, like the recommendation is really to understand the cultural nuance behind choosing not to buy a pit latrine. It's not because they don't want a latrine, but because the idea of using one incites a lot of um, trauma for that person and for, you know, maybe their kids and their grandkids. Um, so instead of pushing pit latrines as a first step, um, suggest something else like sharing with a neighbor or, you know, a plan to save money to buy the wet latrine instead. Um, 
on the next slide, we also met like on the same vein around planning to buy. We met a lot of people who said, I want a latrine, but I don't know the price. I don't know the how to get it installed. I don't know who to contact. And I never asked. And so it's really this waiting, this kind of situation of wanting to wait for a latrine to come to me or when it's time, I'll just get one. But without having adequate information about what it means to actually decide to buy a latrine, make a plan, save money, and then have it installed in the home. Um, and so here, it's really about that intention action gap and filling it in. So helping people make a real plan to adopt the latrine instead of just aspirationally thinking about how one day they're going to get a latrine and make sure that information comes to the participant or comes to the user at the end um, so that even if they're not asking for it, they're still receiving the information so they can learn about the price and the timeline without having to go and find out from the village chief or the latrine business owner or somebody else. Um, next slide. And yeah, one of the other interesting things that I think all of us who try to implement projects know is that oftentimes the person at home during working hours, so from nine to five, the people that are the decision maker might not be home. So uh, if you're going to go implement an IPC session or teach people about the value of latrines and you're getting um, a lot of different participants there, but no one's buying latrines, the decision maker might not be home when the session is happening. So they, the decision maker might be going away um, leaving the home, leaving the uh, village even, practicing OD throughout their day at the farm, and then coming home and never receive information about the village chief. And so here again, hold information sessions, of course, when the decision maker is available, but also if participants are coming who aren't decision makers, equip those people with correct or understandable information um, so that people can, so decision makers can make the decision even if they don't attend the session. Um, and yeah, we have examples of this um, if you if you want to see more. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so I've laid out a couple of different problems, but here's some bright spots that we met in the field. Um, so one lady here on the left, she did it step by step. So she said, we did not have enough money to get a wet latrine. So we started with a pit latrine. And then she saved money for 10 years before she was able to get a wet latrine, but her whole family helps each other. So her daughter gave a little bit of money. Her son gave a little bit of money. Her sister gave a little bit of money. And together they had a latrine that they built on their house comp compound together. Um, so step-by-step -step can work. It's just understanding what the right first step is. And then we also heard from a lot of people that their children motivate them to adopt a latrine. So um, they do it because their daughter wants it, because maybe they feel more safe, but also because it's a symbol of modernity and something that they can, you know, they've seen in the big city and they want it at home as well. So having a latrine means that when she comes home, she doesn't have to OD in the forest. So there are really important motivations for why people adopt latrines as well. And yeah, I think um, before I I move on to the next person, um. One of the interesting things that we um, realized is that everybody that we met in Cambodia was kind of along the marketing funnel. I think my slide got cut off, <laughs> but basically um, this is like a standard marketing funnel from awareness. So I don't know about latrines that work for me. And that would be people who are in the floating village or people with disabilities. Um, so you have to find a way to give them an example of a latrine that works for them. Then you have the people who are interested I think I need a latrine, but not right now. So like maybe I need one later or I don't have a plan. Um, and so you can show them the benefits of a latrine and create the invitation to share. So they're trying the latrine and provide an easy first step um, in terms of the desire. So I want a latrine, but I'm not sure how to get it. So making sure that the information is shared at flexible timings, create a plan to adopt the latrine, share information at home, um, whether it's with takeaway pamphlets or house to house. Um, and then action, I did it, I bought a latrine. So use these examples as bright spots, share their stories and show people how in their village, people like them did the exact same thing and lay out the steps of exactly how. 
um, by creating feasible goals. Um, yeah. So thank you guys. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. But if you have any other questions, um, feel free to send them over in the chat. You can also send us an email. And this here is our, <laughs> our project team in rural Cambodia. Thank you so much, Imara. That was very interesting and very clear. <clears throat> um, now I'd like to introduce uh, you all to our next speaker, Ratha Kong from Engineers Without Borders. He has extensive field experience uh, with engagements across Southeast Asia and Australia, and he'll speak to some sanitation solutions in these challenging environments. Over to you, Ratha. Thank you for giving me the floor. I'm, I'm also a speaker, but I also really uh, hearing the story from the IECD project and also the presentation from Emra about the behavior of the community. It's very connecting and I hope you uh, try to understand more what is the sanitation solution in area which geographic challenge. But uh, in Cambodia, we also understand the term like the sanitation in challenging environment or we call like SCE. Yes, of course, uh, can you move to the next slide? Yes, uh, first my slide, I I would like to introduce you about the uh, characteristic of the common challenging environment in Cambodia. And it is also following the uh, guideline that is called the National Guiding Principle on Sanitation in Challenging Environment for Rural Hotel that published in 2019 that defined the challenging environment as a rural location where it is either difficult to construct conventional latrine or where the use of conventional latrine is likely to contaminate the surrounding environment, particularly groundwater and surface resort. Yes, of course, challenging environment are likely unidentified and unmet it. Yet, uh, the SE technical team also try to categorize in with the five of the challenging. And you can see the first picture the top left that it is in the floating area and in this challenging environment households are floating for or at least a part of each year and they are mostly living in uh, Tunle Sap Lake along and also alongside the Mekong River and conventional latrines are not suitable as it is not possible to bury fear costs like on the household property and additionally the a black water may leach directly into waterway contaminating the environment. And for the uh, water scare area, and you can see the picture in the top middle one, like the, in this challenging environment, if the household lack access to water required to use conventional poor flask latrine pen. And for the picture at the bottom left, it is about a high ground water. And in this challenging environment, households are in area where groundwater level is less than three meters below the ground surface. And use of conventional latrine are not suitable in this area as the soil may be waterlogged and causing the latrine pit to fill up quickly. And moreover, black water also can leach directly into the groundwater and dramatically contaminate the environment. And for the bottom middle one is about a flood affected area. And this area is the household have flood for a period ranging from a week to months and a time in a year. Most of them also living surrounding the uh, Tunle Sub Lake. And the conventional latrin pen constructed at ground level will not be accessible during flooding. And furthermore, black water a uh, slide in a uh, ground level, we also can leak directly into the flood water and groundwater, and it can cause the environmental contamination as well. And the last picture is the right one, is the hard ground, that it is the area which is the, the latrine pit cannot be easily touched by hand, and including it can be rock and hard or clay soil. And in this environmental, uh, the liquid into the ground at significantly uh, slower rate or cannot be uh, absorbed into the ground. And as the result, um, Latin pit fill up at a faster rate. And furthermore, if there are 
rock with fracture and uh, black water also can be go to impact the ground water. Can you move to the next slide? EWB also have a chance to conduct the fear assessment with the two provinces that one is the Kampong Tom and another uh, the Pravi here that both of the province also have some area that have the challenging environment as well. And I don't want to talk uh, much on this one because like a sister, uh, Mr. Pari and also Amira also talk about behavior related to the uh, community, but I want to rest related to the another challenging that uh, we observe that because of uh, the lack of the awareness of proper sanitation and also the major challenging that also facing from the uh, local sanitation local conductor that have been uh, difficulty to install the sanitation because uh, it is quite hard to reaching for the high ground and also it's also the barrier which difficult for local business and another sanitation implementer to identify often yeah, like the uh, install the uh, construction. And for the material availability, also not quite challenged for those provinces because it can have uh, in the district level. However, the transportation still a barrier for like the floating area. And for the next slide. So after we conduct the fee assessment, also understand from the desktop review, and we here, we have another step that gathering the uh, existing technology that have worked in the Cambodia. And the way we screen, we also following the uh, guideline that we call SE technology uh, compendium that uh, have the eight acceptance criteria, which I want to tell you that the first one is related to the minimize risk to human health that ensure that the user be benefit from uh, improved health outcome. And the next is about the minimize risk to the surrounding environment that is related to environment impact are minimized. And third is a uh, low for safely manage the cost like management. And four is accessible for all user that ensure the user are able to assess and benefit of sanitation technology. And fifth is the promote uh, hygiene behavior that the user are able to achieve improve health outcome by maintaining hygiene uh, practice. And the sixth is to maintain user dignity and it is minimize public disruption and is safe to, to use. And seven is ensure that technology is resilient, sustainable and easy for community to use. And the last one is the technology have to be like economic call to be uh, and uh, maintain it. Make sure that the user do not have uh, unreasonable economic pressure placed upon them to construct, or operate, and maintain the technology. Next slide, please. So here is several the technology that existing in Cambodia currently and also in the past. I have rest it for the six technology. And it is doesn't mean that those technology is only one solution for them, but it is it's kind of the choice for them. It is also like the example for the uh, local contractor and also the community consider to use that or cho uh, choose that technology for their different challenging environment. So for the, I want to present uh, about the picture at the bottom left is namely a uh, knock hall toilet. It is designed to adapt to seasonal flood affected area for use both during and the after flood. And this technology is subcontract system consisting three row of concrete ring and the toilet superstructure including toilet pan must be constructed at the level equal to the house above of the uh, flood level and it is connected to the main pit and the main and the wastewater storage pit are fully sealed including the bottom and during the dry period each pit receives wastewater which is ultimately discharged by an anaerobic treatment with the aggregate sand and charcoal filter 
in the Litchfield pit. And during the flood period, a switch outlet is used to control the wastewater flow to the Litchfield, blocking the flow of wastewater to Litchfield or external environment. And after the flood exists, the wastewater is directly to the Litchfield pit and the wastewater storage pit can store waste for up to three months during the flood uh, period. And for the picture of the top middle one, it is about the hard sand pit. And this system is designed for use in hard ground and hard clay soil, which low permeability red area and wastewater discharge from the, the sanitation system undergo treatment that minimize negative impact to the environment. And the system can be installed at a depth of 0.7 meter to minimize difficulty in ditching and the soil in hard ground area. With the pit rest 0.3 meter above the uh, ground level to avoid a local flash flood. In addition, the concrete pit are fully sheer and to ensure wastewater is content and does not leak to the environment prior to treatment and prevent the water from outside entering the pit that caused the pit to fill quickly. And waste from the toilet pan is collected to, into the switching box, allow the flow into one pit of the main pit, pit when the used pit is full, and then switch to use another pit of the twin pit. And for the picture at the bottom uh, middle one, and the uh, hard ground sanitation system, that it is include a septic tank made from a brick and is fully sealed as well to ensure that wastewater is contained and does not leak to the environment prior to treatment. And septic tank connect to the leach wheel containing aggregate, charcoal, and also sand. And the system function as fiscal and wastewater storage with two chambers inside for primary treatment and the upper chamber function as a scum barrier that prevents scum from plucking the outlet pipe and the lower chamber function as the slide barrier. And the two chamber system ensure only liquid waste can flow into the leach wheel through the outlet pipe. And this system also connect to the leach wheel as the uh, top one. And for the top and right hand side is about all season upgrade or we call AFU that was designed as an SE product as well to upgrade that can connect to an existing pit as that is considerable more marketable than a new alternative design to the standard pit. And the pit cost like from the top ring of the, the existing pit system is empty to ensure that there is no clocking of the system when the uh, ASU is installed. And this system the, uh, the, the, the existing pit contained into a filter pit through a pipe system and the existing pit content then undergo primary treatment in the filter pit. And the filter pit is filled with gravel and offer a preliminary treatment rector for using biological oxygen and um, also turbidity and uh, pathogen and preventing the leach wheel from uh, clocking also. For the picture of the bottom and right hand side, and it is about a central latrine pan that are water saving device that have the potential to replace conventional uh, ceramic uh, latrine pan commonly used throughout a water scare area of rural Cambodia. And the central pan is a plastic latrine pan uh, developed in Bangladesh by uh, ID and American standard, and now uh, produced by Lysis company that use much less water than a ceramic pan. And it is made uh, from a polished durable, durable plastic, which allow the matter to go straight into the pit. And it's also easy to clean and maintain. And uh, however, it is not uh, easily available in the market right now because uh, it used to be authorized distributor, but it is ended and we had to find this product in uh, local in Cambodia. And all alternative and alternative option to this is to invest in the development of a local product as well 
for water sphere challenging environment with local material and make it more accessible and also reliable. And for the top picture and the left hand side, it is related to handy pot that uh, very fit for the floating area. I not present it and let this uh, describe more with the system from uh, Tapper for the next picture. Yes, so uh, thank you for uh, attending. And yes, our purpose is to harness the potential of engineering to create an equitable reality for the planet and its people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Rafa. Um, and to our next speaker, last but not least, uh, I hand over to Tabor Hand, PhD director and founder of uh, Wetlands Work. He is an experienced innovator in water sanitation sector who will talk about the HandyPod solution. Over to you, Tabor. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, thank you, USAID and RTI for pulling all this together. Next slide, please. Uh, Wetlands work as a, a social enterprise. We're very small. We also have an NGO element to our work um, called Clean Water by Wetlands Work. Uh, we're working primarily in, in Cambodia. We're working primarily on the Great Lake, which is also called Tonle Sap Lake. And it is uh, an inland ocean. It's the world's most complex hydroecological system, as well as the world's most productive inland freshwater fishery by square by by area. Um, we are working in approximately 26 villages on the lake and have uh, trained six LBO or local business organizations how to um, source our technology materials, how to make them, how to maintain them, how to market them as well. Uh, so we're very much involved in the scaling up through marketing of local business people. Next slide, please. Next slide. This is a typical uh, floating village along a uh, tributary to the Great Lake. There are also large enclaves of floating villages on the lake itself. But during the dry season, the water on the lake is approximately one to one and a half meters deep, it lasts for about six months of the year before the water rises up to about eight meters in depth. So there's a huge hydrologic change. But during those four to six months of low water, the water becomes black, uh, odiferous, uh, methane bubbles bubble up, and uh, there is no oxygen in the water uh, such that uh, larval fish cannot have their successful recruitments along these kinds of tributaries. Next slide, please. So what we have developed is uh, is called, we call it the handy pod. It's basically a uh, three containers that are side by side. Uh, gravity flow moves the water along from the container on the left, which receives the waste and poor flush water into the, that first septic container. And then it moves into a second and a third container. Each container uh, has a retention time of approximately five days. Um, and that's just by the number of users and the amount of water that is put into it on a daily basis. Uh, the second and third containers have a significant amount of uh, surface area inside them. And that is the engine that drives the system, or at least that's the home for the engine that drives the system, being the microbial activity that attaches itself to that surface area, creates biofilm, and that is what just creates a cleaner and cleaner um, discharge water. So the water that leaves the third container for a family of six people or less is um, basically meets the recreational water quality. 
terms of discharge. It's much, much cleaner. We are getting approximately a six order, sometimes a seven order log reduction in um, pathogens measured by E. coli. We are also containing the, the biomass in the first, the fecal mass in the first container, which reduces the biological oxygen demand in the ambient water as well. And that first container is the one that gets addressed for fecal sludge management. Next slide, please. Uh, to, to build our uh, handy pods, we train local people from within the water-based community. These are people that know the situation, that are not people that have had experience with cement rings and such. Um, and it's important to us to have at least two members of a four to five member team, uh, sometimes six member team, be female, because we find that the women are the best marketers to provide the awareness and the, the, the demand um, for sanitation, basically because they're talking women to women. And often we find that women in the households are the decision makers. Um, next slide, please. So at scale, um, this is a floating village on the lake that is not on a river um, tributary. It's on the lake proper itself. There are about 900 to 800 houses here. And we figure that one LBO can service about 700 houses. Uh, once the handy pods are built, or there is a build out of handy pods, and we figure that it's necessary to have a 75% uh, build out in the population to significantly uh, improve the water quality such that children will no longer be stunted and such that the adults will not be experiencing um, at least once a month diarrheal events, um, which is the average on people for the people living on the lake. Um, but this, uh, the, the, the LBO needs to be fairly professional and uh, we require at least a year's oversight in terms of their quality control to be able to be professional business people, um, to be charging the right amounts, whatever the price point is that they can reach with the households. It's approximately uh, $350 or more for a LBO to supply and provide and make a profit. Uh, it may even be more than that. Um, next slide, please. Our fecal sludge management, um, we have developed a protocol that uh, requires the sludge to be pumped out of the first tank and uh, pumped onto land, whether it's by a series of containers uh, from one pump to the next pumping, but pumped onto the land during the dry season. It's a dry season uh, fecal sludge management pro protocol. And as long as the uh, ditch is maybe 10 to 15 centimeters deep and 20 centimeters wide and three meters long, that's sufficient for a typical household's sludge uh, and some of its black water. And that gets covered over and sequestered maybe with a fence or such or tape. Um, and left for uh, at least a year's flood cycle. What we found is that the E. coli goes to the ambient soil level, which is zero, in about five weeks during the dry season. So we figure that one year is sufficient. Maybe if we're dealing with the Ministry of Health, it's gonna be two years, but uh, this is what we train our LBOs and our uh, local household owners of handy pods, how to deal with the sludge. Um, it takes approximately two years to fill up the sludge for a 
four to six family uh, house, four to six member family. Thank you. Next slide. Um, I'd be amiss if I didn't put a global scale to this uh, issue about challenging environments and floating or high groundwater environments. Uh, what you see in front of you on the right-hand side is Shanghai, China, and on the left is Bangkok, Thailand. And the gray um, area was the 2015 uh, inundation or high tide level inundation in these two cities. And the blue is what was found in the 2019 update of the, um, the sea level rise projected. And we now in 2024, five years later, have found that the sea level is rising significantly faster and will probably be higher. And so what you see here is a limited version of the extent of flooding and the need for addressing challenging environment sanitation. The Handypod is appropriate for areas like this uh, or some type of arrangement that is nature-based and microbial driven and um, doesn't need a lot of maintenance. There are no moving parts. You use gravity. Uh, we think that the Handypod is a, an appropriate way to address a lot of areas outside of Cambodia. Um, and um, I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tabor. All right, we don't have too much time left, but we'd like to open it up now to a uh, panel discussion. So if all the panelists come back on. Um, I think uh, the first question I'll ask to the panel, I think for maybe Rotha and Tabor uh, is, uh, what is the willingness to pay for some of these sanitation solutions? And what are some strategies to overcome uh, low willingness to pay if you encounter that? Yeah, will, over willingness to, you. to pay is is a very important factor um and the the I, we believe that the lbos the local business organizations have to negotiate uh village by village or at least set their prices and stick to those um but uh these people in the floating communities and in most challenging environments because they're places that don't readily get developed uh because of the flooding uh, people are poor, and so the need for subsidies is going is very apparent. Though in the floating communities, there are some households. And we don't know exactly what percentage, but it might be as much as twenty percent or thirty percent um, can afford to pay three hundred and fifty dollars or more for uh, a handy pod. The aspirational aspect is the key driving force. It's upscale. It makes them feel good. There's also dignity and other elements uh, of safety and hygiene practice and such that are positive. Uh, the health benefits for handipods and, and such are less recognized than the aspirational value. So aspiration is what's driving the willingness to pay. Thanks. Ratha, anything to add on willingness to pay? Yes. Um, it is may not uh, about the payment, but it is about the technical team that try to minimize the cost. Because like uh, experience from ASU, they have been trying to work closely in the ground and looking for the local material that possible to construct the system. So, and also working with the closely with the OBO that to understand how to construct it properly and also saving the time and also saving the energy to do this the system. So all those combined between the local material and LBO understanding how to install it, the cost can be uh, decreased on this one. And some area because related to the challenging, it can cause the uh, community not cannot use the conventional toilet as well. So they have to commit it to which has the solution that have to uh, 
so the problem not using the uh, conventional toilet. Great, thanks. Uh, I think the next question uh, may be targeted for Imara. How does religious or cultural factors uh, figure into your uh, social and behavior change strategy? And what tools did you use particularly to help ensure use of them after uh, adoption of the latrines? Um, yeah, so I'm sure that um, Bong Sopari can also add in more here, but in terms of the religious and cultural factors, I think one thing we did note is that religion isn't necessarily a barrier to adoption. So there's always, there's no reason why religion would stop people from adopting latrines in Cambodia. Um, and in terms of um, religion as an enabler or something that drives adoption, um, we didn't really see so much of it. I think that um, the religious uh, members of the community are like the monks and people like that. They're an important um, messenger of information and they can probably motivate people. But we didn't hear that it was necessarily something that pushes or stops people from adopting latrines. But of course, the team that's um, in Cambodia have been doing this for longer and no more. Um, in terms of culture, I think that, um, like Tabor mentioned, it is quite aspirational um, to have a latrine. And having a latrine um, is something that can make your family feel modern. And especially when there's like a new family being formed through marriage or something like that, having a new latrine as part of your new home can be something that people are proud of. Um, but at the same time, sometimes people view having a latrine as out of their reach. And so providing people with a clear um, awareness of the price and the options that they have available. So like literally like a catalog of things that they can buy and the price that it should be and making it very easy for them to understand how to save um, helps people um, develop the ability to purchase. In terms of long-term use, I think that was one of the issues that we flagged, especially with regard to fecal sludge management. Um, that's going to be, I think, Cambodia's next big challenge. And I'll actually pass over to Sopari um, to answer more on that. Thank you, Imre. I just want to uh, briefly add on the cultural factor. You are right. I don't think there is any barrier uh, in terms of uh, the cultural practice belief uh, toward adopting Latin. For fiscal slack management, for so sure it it's continue to be a challenge as I raised already. Uh, not just rural area, but countrywide, we still have a big challenge on addressing fiscal slack management. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, I think we're reaching the top of the hour, and we are going to have to cut the webinar off. Um, but I really want to thank everyone who was able to join today. Uh, really interesting uh, experience shared with us. Uh, really interesting solutions. Uh, I really encourage everyone, if you have further questions that we weren't able to get to, please feel free to reach out to uh, all the speakers. You can see their contact information on the screen here. Um, and want to appreciate everything the speakers were able to provide to this webinar today. Uh, on behalf of those speakers and USAID, really appreciate everyone joining. Thank you so much.